Hey booktube, welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. My dogs are super cute. Oh, Roxy just climbed in the bed with Daisy. As you can see over in the corner there, there they go, yes. Happy Friday, booktube, we finally made it. Wow, it was a long week, <laughs> busy week. Um, I thought I'd make a chatty. Uh, Friday Reads video as I move my keyboard out of the way so I can be closer to the microphone. Um, kind of a busy day. Uh, worked half a day today uh, as, as I normally do on Friday and then I had a doctor's appointment which had me in the vicinity of a Barnes and Noble and uh, actually had a magazine that I wanted to pick up on the newsstand um, because I, I just subscribed to the magazine, but I, I really wanted this issue that's out right now. And I know that typically when you subscribe to a new magazine, it takes uh, four to six weeks to get it. Now, I could end up getting a duplicate, but um, that's okay. I really wanted to get it uh, because there's a interesting feature article. And then William T. Volman is a, wrote an article on the, the Korean DMZ zone, or well, that's redundant, the de demilitarized zone um, of Korea. So that does intrigue me. Um, I'll show you that magazine in a second. So uh, yeah, I went to Burns and Noble, um, got a couple of periodicals. And so I thought, you know what, I've got a stack of periodicals that have come in. And I'll show you some of the books I'm starting this week, or have already started. Um, some of them are most of them are for review, uh, review work. Um, and a lot of these books could t could fit into my uh, new History on the Horizon um, series because they're new history. The, these are all advanced reading copies of uh, history books that have will be coming out in, um, oh, I'm looking at Nove September, October, and November. And these, were, I don't believe, were featured in my last new History on the Horizon because they came in after that. So we're going to cover some books that I'm reading. We're going to cover some periodicals, and we're going to start with that first. First, I want to start with uh, uh, an article that I'm, or a story, I should say, that I'll be reading this weekend. I'm actually, I'm actually about of a third of the way into it, um, but um, this is kind of different, you guys. If you got any Twilight Zone fans out there and Rod Serling fans, I want to make you aware of this magazine. Uh, the interesting thing about this magazine, it's published in England and. It's very popular, obviously, um, but they don't have, they don't, I, I never know, there's no volume number on here that I can find. It doesn't go by monthly, like, oh, this is your August issue, um, or does it? Oh, it just says issue LXX. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Roman numerals, I don't go that high. Um, anyway, it's The Strand, it's The Strand magazine. And as a first, the the daughters of Rod Serling um, agreed to, they, they found an unpublished short story that he wrote about his time in World War II, which I didn't even know that about Rod Serling, um, that he fought in World War II. So, um, and it takes up about 20, 25 pages of the magazine. Um, and they and the editorial talks about it his daughters like how they came about to you know they wrote like um forwards but uh the short story is called first squad first platoon and it's the first time any of us are seeing this so um i was really tickled to see this and i wanted to share that with you um i'm not sure how you order these when they're not even listed as being like a you know like a bi-monthly i guess you just go on their website and just say i want the uh i want the, i want this issue with um broad serling's um uh, unpublished short story so i'll be reading that this week sorry this weekend um yeah and it kind of ends on page 27 so it goes quite a ways it kind of like each little chapter focuses on one of the certain guys in this um in this platoon in the squad in this platoon um so check it out you guys i know i grew up watching twilight zone loved it and i all these years had no idea that rod serling um uh, fought in world war ii and wrote a story about it so um i will 
at some point in one of my videos after I've read it, I'll, I might mention to you what I thought about it, but I, I think it's, it's, it's really good. I'm, I'm enjoying the first few pages I've read so far. Uh, I've read so much military and war memoir and fiction. So, I mean, I, I'm pretty steeped in it. Um, so nothing really kind of, you know, blows me away, but the fact that it's Rod Serling and uh, the fact that we get a little more insight into his dreams and wishes and how he'd like to be remembered, like his daughters, you know, say that, you know, dad just wanted, he really wanted to, folks to kind of remember that, um, yeah, he was a writer, you know, and he wrote teleplays and screenplays and obviously, you know, put together that production studio to put together the uh, Twilight Zone. Um, so there's lots of cool information in here. And uh, not to mention the Strand Magazine is just a heck of, a heck of a lot of fun, especially if you're like me and you like mysteries and thrillers. So I'm seeing a lot of other article, articles in here that I want to read. Um, Robert Little on the anatomy of a spy novel, and he's the, he's the guy that's written all the big novels on the CIA and stuff like that. Um, so this looks just like a, a fantastic issue. Um, so check out the, uh, Strand Magazine. It, again, it doesn't give me a date or a volume number on here, um, but just look for the one with Rod Serling. And a thanks to the folks at Strand Magazine and one of their publicists emailed me. I don't even, I've never been contacted by a, a magazine to say, the fact that they even knew me. And they're like, we've got a, we've got a short story here we think, we, you know, you enjoy and your, your, your viewership would like to know about. And I was like, heck yeah. So, um kind of makes me want to get a subscription again like i mentioned matt last time that one time i tried to subscribe to the strand i i got one issue and a bunch of postcards like little gifty things tchotchkes and i, I never got another one and i'm like i'm supposed to get more than one issue right like i don't know how their subscription base works but anyway um so there's that. Oh, I wanted to share this with you as well. Finally got the August, got my print edition of the August issue of Historical Novels Review. And this, now I actually have something physical to show you. This is what I talk about when I say I am a U.S. Reviews editor um, at Historical Novels Review. So, um, and then here's one of my reviews on the back, actually. I, I read and reviewed Butcher, which is in here. Um, I highly encourage you to check out the uh, Historical Novel Society website. Um, you don't have to be a historical novelist. Um, you could be someone who just supports historical fiction, like you love historical fiction and you just love being around writers. Um, anyone can join. And, uh, and your membership includes a subscription um, to this. It comes how many times a year, Peggy? Six times a year? Yeah, six times a year, I think. Oh, uh, wait, August... Number. actually four four times a year uh and it's 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 a well put together you know uh, there's no color on the inside but it you don't really need that because we've got so much stuff in here um and uh yeah i'm on the masthead there reviews editors usa i'm on there so uh takes up a lot of my time but it's it's a lot of fun and I get to see what's coming um, um, these are wonderfully written reviews we've got great reviewers on staff great editors and it divides them up by um, the historical fiction by century so you can kind of go to like the century you like the most and see what's new what's out there and read these reviews um, let's see if I can find one of mine <laughs> right I'm always looking for that well you just like to see the the result of your the work you put in, you know. You like to to kind of just peruse and make sure everything uh, turned out all right. Yeah, this was an editor's choice actually. My my choice because it was a really good book. So there's my review of Butcher. I can't do this right. There we go. Um, which can also be read online, I believe. So just. Google historical novel society dot org or whatever and you'll you'll be taken right there. So there's my August issue. And that's uh, another issue put to bed. Well done. We're currently working on the November issue right now. Uh, just sent off. Oh, I actually went to the post office this afternoon to send off a a print copy for a reviewer so that they can review it. And then I just started a subscription again. They they keep. 
they've hounded me for years and I finally said, I'll try you again. And I'm glad I did because uh, they finally did a redesign on this magazine. I, cannot, I never could enjoy reading this magazine because the old style was just was so boring. <laughs> but anyway, I thought with uh, the way the world is on fire and uh, the country's whatever, I just was like, it's time to get back to National Review. <laughs> Um, so I got, this is my first issue, this is the September, um, and they definitely have done a redesign, which I appreciate. Uh, they still have those, they've got more, uh, color artwork in here for each, uh, column, so things are more just distinctive, you know, um, so I just think this is a more reader-friendly national review, hopefully. Um, but we'll see. I have not, I haven't partaken. I don't know who's on their staff, if anyone has changed. I know Noah Rothman has come over uh, to national review from commentary. So that's another reason why I've really always enjoyed the commentary magazine and that crew on their podcast. So I thought I'd give national review another shot. It was super cheap. It was like twenty dollars and I got for a two year <laughs> then I got another uh, another TLS baby super intelligence repair it uh, Phil Ball takes a dim view of AI well don't we all um but no <laughs> um yeah I've got a I'm trying to bone up a lot on AI because in my line of work that's something um that I'm going to be working around and closely with and or Anyway, just to say that uh, these are things I want to read. And then I got a new issue of Ancient History, Origins of Empire, the Age of Augustus. These are wonderful magazines, wonderful historical magazines, colorful, descriptive, educational. Um, there you go. Love it. My subscription on this ran out, but I think this is might be my last issue, or they're trying to woo me with a couple of extra ones, but um, I still need to read the other ones. Uh, that's why I haven't renewed. Only if I've read some of them will I renew, but, um, and if I liked it. But this is Ancient Egypt. One of these glossy, oversized magazines. Uh, you know, it was okay, uh, but for the money, mm, I don't know. I mean, the pictures the, 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 are gorgeous. I mean, this is my only way I'm ever going to see Egypt and all these ruins, you know, in, in this life. So, um, so you know, complimentary, please don't leave us copy of Ancient Egypt. Of course, I got another. I'm a member of the U.S. Naval Institute, and I always get a, an, a, a copy of their Proceedings magazine. I like looking at their book reviews in the back. Uh, they got a, a book review in the back of Strike of the Sailfish. I want to read. Um, I'm also interested in seeing if I could maybe even write a review for this magazine. So I need to kind of send a query in. Um, and then some of the articles, you know, they're maybe super technical and for people who are active duty and are in involved in this stuff. So I don't read everything, but sometimes these proceedings magazines will have something interesting, especially uh, tied into a historical aspect of the Navy. Um, or it could tie into a current event that I find particularly interesting, like the Russian-Ukraine war and, you know, what our policy, how we're training to... to uh, to meet that exigency in case anything happens that we might have to get involved. You know, they, they kind of talk about, you know, where we're at. Um, you know, uh, new ways of uh, fighting war warfare. It's just these these are the type of, um, I don't want to say, they're not user manual, but they act as like a user manual, though, um, when you're trying to, you first of all, you've got to be like a, a person who's into military stuff and military history and uh, also our, our military, um, you know, uh, our, our, our build up, but not our build up, but um, how we're, how we're maintaining our standards if we are, which I don't think we're, the Navy is, we need to build more ships is what I'm saying. But anyway, and that, that comes through in these pages a lot. It's just that, you know, having to, having drawn down so much, 
um, now we're having to look at doing other different ways of doing things like this right here, this article. Um, well, this is about the Coast Guard. Oh, Mark, Mark Richardson, you might really enjoy this article. I don't know if you get this magazine. I would imagine you would um, if you're, you must. But anyway, here's a better way to organize the Coast Guard. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and then there was this other article I wanted to show you. Oh, anyway. Yeah, and this one, okay, so duh. Yeah, this is all about focus on the Coast Guard. So this is the whole issue. It could be Mark Richardson's here, but really cool stuff. Awesome photos. Um, I always enjoy browsing through the proceedings uh, magazine of the U.S. Naval Institute. Now, what am I reading as we are 15 minutes in? I'll show you one I just power read, and I wrote a review, submitted it, filed it Thursday night, and uh, should be running next week, uh, or it might be live now. Actually, I need to check. I have decided I will be doing a follow-up video once this uh, author's concluding book comes out in 2025. I'm going to feature all three books and kind of just do a video on these and just encourage people to read it because this is a fantastic historical fiction trilogy. So excited to also have the second book assigned to me for review and it helped that I had read the first one obviously. So um and this this author, she is amazing. She just goes from strength to strength and this uh finished reading Cold War, Bridge to Tomorrow by Helena P. Schrader. This is put up by Cross Seas Press. Um, this, this author just kind of sprung on me. She, uh, she was just like a surprise, um, had never heard of this book or, you know, the, the whole premise behind it, which is a trilogy looking at the Berlin airlift. Um, the first book was called Cold Peace right before the Soviets, um, you know, it talked about the tensions of the, uh, the, the four allies, you know, the, the allies and how they broke up Berlin into four sectors, um, but she has so many characters and she she has so many different little like sub stories and subplots and she has a finger on all of these different threads and she just doesn't miss a beat you guys she does not miss a beat and the characters are wonderfully well drawn and she look and she her history of just what what was going on in Berlin at the time is is impeccable like she she's got a PhD um, from the University of Hamburg and she has the Berlin airlift really is, uh, she's also like an aviation expert, or I think she's also a pilot. So she, she speaks into this on so many different levels, and it's so authentic and so enjoyable, you guys. So anyway, finished reading Cold War. The final volume is Cold Victory, and, and that, according to her website, will be coming out in 2025. And I really do hope, because I'm reviewing this for Book Trip. So I hope Book Trib will have that one, and I can also review that. And I'll have a complete set, but we'll see. Complete uh, review of all three books, but um, it's great. Um, I'll read it to you real quick. Berlin is under siege. More than two million civilians in Hitler's former capital will starve unless they receive food, medicine, and more by air. Um, RAF flying officer Kit Moran and U.S. Air Force Captain J.B. Baranowski once risked their lives to drop high explosives on Berlin. They are about to deliver milk, flour, and children's shoes instead. Meanwhile, two women pilots are flying an air ambulance that carries malnourished and abandoned children to freedom in the West until General Winter deploys on the side of Russia. Um, based on historical events award-winning novelist and she has won awards so, i mean she deserves them delivers an insightful exciting and moving tale about how former enemies became friends in the face of russian aggression and how close the berlin airlift came to failing um, um under the assault of winter now this book ends in november of 1948 so i know cold victory is really gonna peel back the horrors of that first um uh, winter during the airlift um but it was a great, great book, and I got the review done in time, barely. <laughs> um, so, having done that, oh, and I finished reading another book. Did I put it away? I did. But never fear. Check out my social media um, stuff below in the description box, you know, my little icons and links. Um, follow me on there because, like I said before on this channel, I'm, you know, if you're new to this channel, first of all, welcome. Um, 
I, I uh, put out on social media whenever I have a new uh, written review that is out. Um, I'll usually put up a picture of the book, the dust jacket cover, you know, and uh, just say, hey, check out my review here. So I've got, I've got a couple and I'm way behind on posting. So just to let you know how much I've been reading lately, and that may not be reflected recently in my um, my posting because I was on a business trip a week ago and I'm still kind of just catching up. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six reviews that I still need to put up on social media. So those are done behind me in the rear view. <laughs> so um, in one of them, oh, that is not even published yet. Well, I just filed a review on a little slim volume I'm very excited about and I want my friend Jill Watts out there if you're watching um, a little slim volume um, about uh, another writer reflecting on the life of and what it and her own thoughts on the impact and influence of um, a very prominent important black educator and black civil rights um, figure and that is Mary McLeod Bethune who I first came into contact reading Jill Watts's brilliant book, The Black Cabinet. So um, now it's not a full length biography at all of uh, Bethune. It's not meant to be, but you're just, you're really going to want to have a full length biography on Bethune after you finish reading this book, as well as The Black Cabinet. And I keep, you know, last time I, I had chatted with uh, Jill, I was like, now you're going to write her biography, right? <laughs> I know she would love to. Um, she, Mary McLeod Bethune was just an amazing woman. And I was so, t- so not tickled, but I was, I was really, I was really honored to, to write that um, review and, and put that up. Um, it's a book browse. It's coming up at book, book browse next week, I think. Um, but again, I'll put that on social media so you'll see that. Anyway, so all that to say is, is I'm doing quite a bit here. Um, I know it never seems like enough because of all the, you know, the books that I show you and the book hauls I do and everyone's like, what are you, do you ever have time to read all these things? I am always reading you guys. I just want you to know, I mean, I, there's no physical way I can finish every single book that comes across this table desk but um I have to pick and choose and also I'm assigned or you know I'm assigned certain things so um yeah so that's how it works but just know that I'm always reading um uh, always reading so uh, I should say I hope to get this scheduled I'm checking with the guys right now to see if they would like to do a, a book chat um to follow up on what we did for D-Day uh, and just talk about D-Day, Stephen E. Ambrose's. I just have a, a few chapters left. Um, yeah, just a few chapters left. So it's, it was an insane... It, I did not expect to be as busy as I was this summer. So, And I know the summer's not over, but um, I really wanted to have... I really wanted this to have been done by now so that we could have posted a book chat, but um, we'll see. We might still do it. And maybe in the next couple weeks. Okay, so that's what I'm reading now, still. A new book I have begun as of last night. And I'm, I'm already uh, just, really just, just infuri- infuriates me and disgusts me. But um, this is Savings and Trust, The Rise and Betrayal of the Freedmen's Bank by Justine Hill Edwards. Uh, This is coming out from W.W. Norton. Uh, This book will come out October. Um, So it's it's not a real uh, thick book, but boy, it doesn't, it's telling a very focused history. Um, Let me read to you the description on the back. In the years immediately after the Civil War, tens of thousands of former slaves deposited millions of dollars into the Freedmen's Bank. African Americans envisioned this new bank as a launching pad for economic growth and self-determination. But only nine years after it opened, their trust was betrayed and the Freedmen's Bank collapsed. Fully informed by new archival findings, historian Justine Hill Edwards unearths a major turning point in American history in this comprehensive account of the Freedmen's Bank and its depositors. 
She illuminates the hope with which the bank was first envisioned and demonstrates the significant setback that the sabotage of the bank caused in the fight for economic autonomy. Hill Edwards argues for a new interpretation of its tragic failure. The bank's white financiers drove the bank into the ground, not Frederick Douglass, its final president, or its black depositors and cashiers. A page-turning story, Savings and Trust, is necessary reading for those seeking to understand the roots of racial economic inequality in America. Okay. I don't know enough about this bank, uh, about the bank itself, for my just my Civil War reading and Reconstruction reading. I, sh I mean, I should have... I mean, the Reconstruction books I've read have talked about the Freedmen's Bank, but not so much the... Um, this new interpretation that she's taking. Um, in the 30 pages I've read, she seems to have already made the case that, yes, the white financiers, you know, um, stole people's money. Um, so if that's the case, then uh, that that's just yet another disgusting uh, thing that happened back then. That's just horrible. Just don't mess with people's money. People work hard. You know, what is going on? I have a hot button issue when it comes to, um, and that's why I think one of the reasons why, one of the rent, many reasons why I, I love Lincoln is he said something about like, you know, and it spoke to my, um, I have a deep affinity for just the value of work, the dignity of work, the dignity of receiving pay for your work, right? Um, and, you know, Lincoln spoke to that um, when he said, you know, do you really think it's okay to, like, a man works, a man or a woman works all day for their bread and you're going to take that bread away from them? Like, what has happened? That is not, that's not, well, first of all, it's just not, it's not the right thing to do in any sense of, uh, even outside of religion or a basis in, in faith, it's just like, it's just the most baseline, the most basic thing that you can do is just pay someone for the work that they do, <laughs> you know, um, obviously. So the fact that these people put money into this bank and trusted it with their savings um, uh, and then just uh, she talks about there was over 60,000 people that lost, were, you know, when the, the bank went under. They, they, they lobbied, they tried to get the, the government to try to, you know, um, compensate them for the money that, that was lost. And uh, it doesn't appear that that ever happened. But anyway, she's going to go into more detail. I'm only 30 pages in, but I've gotten a lot in those 30 pages. And uh, getting a nice little education, too, in the differences between different types of banking. You know, like uh, there's some banking stuff in here, like, you know, commercials versus joint stock versus savings banks and stuff like that. So, um yeah, The Rise and Betrayal of the Freedmen's Bank, Savings and Trust, Justine Hill Edwards. comes out in October, and I'm off to a good start with that. Another book I need to start this weekend, and I'll be writing a review for, the Washington Independent Review of Books. I am actually a few pages into the intro, but it's a Civil War book, and I'm so excited. Well, I guess that's Civil War era, but this is an actual battle book. And I'm very excited. This is by the author of that magisterial um, biography of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., I believe. This is Stephen Budiansky. And his new book comes out in, uh, next month, September. I don't have a, do I have a date yet? Uh, I don't know. But it's a slim little volume, but it's A Day in September, The Battle of Antietam and the World It Left Behind. Also, another great W.W. W. Norton title. Ah, I'm reviewing two, <laughs> two Norton titles. What? Um, yeah, it comes out in September. Let me see. I wish... Okay. Uh, I didn't get a pub sheet. My editor mailed me this copy, so I don't have the pub sheet. But let me see what I can... And the back is all blurbs. Okay, the Battle of Antietam, which took place on September 17th, 1862 remains the single bloodiest day in America's history. As a turning point in the Civil War, the narrow Union victory was the key catalyst for Lincoln to issue the Emancipation 
emancipation proclamation, right? Yet Antietam was not only a battle that dramatically changed the fortunes and meaning of the war, it also changed America in ways we feel today. Antietam ushered in a new beginning in politics, military strategy, gender roles, well, probably with the nurses, okay, battlefield medicine, war photography, and the values and worldview of the post-war generation. Hmm, a masterful and fine-grained account of the battle and the intimate experiences of those who were there, a day in September, expands this view to encompass Antietam's enduring legacy in American society and culture. So uh, I'm curious to see how he's going to do that, uh, how he's going to tie in the culture. Um, oh, I think I like the way he's um, perfect. I see how he's... he's um, organizing and structuring the book is that each chapter kind of focuses on an aspect um, via one person. So you've got Robert E. Lee, A Problem of Engineering for George McClellan, uh, Jacob Cox, The Assault Heroic, um, Organizing for Carnage, Jonathan Letterman, MD. So we're talking about like the, you know, the doctors. Um, War at the operational level, James Longstreet. So this is going to be fantastic. I can't wait to, to dip into this. Sometimes I just want a really good Civil War battle book. I just want to look at a battle from every angle. Um, but, and not just militarily, I'd, I'd like to see how it, it impacted the, uh, the society at large and uh, literature and stuff like that. So that's what I'll be starting this weekend. Um... I did not get to this one in time. I wanted to review it for sh shelf awareness. So I felt bad because I have to have these done a month in front of the, um, the pub date. So, but I've decided I'm going to kind of do my own review of it on this channel. I'll talk about it um, because this, I'm really, I was really excited for this book and I really wanted to read it, but it's so... It's 500 pages, and the review would have been due um, by the time I finished my other two deadlines and finished the reading on Cold uh, War and everything else that was piling up. I just, I couldn't get this done by um, today. Today would be the review date. <laughs> Even if I stretched it to Monday, I mean, that's a big book, guys, but it's Hiroshima, The Last Witnesses by M.G. Scheftel. Um so I've got the Uncorrected Proof, comes out September 10th. Um, I'm really eager to read this book. So I just wanted to share that with you, let you know I will be reading it, and I'll talk about it on this channel because this is actually volume one. He's going to be writing more than, than just this. Let me read this to you here. Well, it's going to be a two-book series, but this is the first volume. Uh, in a two-book series about each of the atomic bomb drops that ended the Pacific War, based on years of irreplicable personal interviews and survivors to tell a story of devastation and resilience. In this vividly rendered historical nar narrative, M.G. Scheftel layers the stories of Hibakusha, the Japanese word for atomic bomb survivors, in harrowing detail to give a minute-by-minute -minute report of August 6, 1945, in the lead-up and aftermath of the world-changing bombing mission of Paul Tibbetts, Enola Gay, and Little Boy. These survivors and witnesses who now have an average age over 90 years old are quite literally the last people who can still provide us with reliable and detailed testimony about life in their cities before the bombings, tell us what they experienced on the day those cities were obliterated, and give us some appreciation of what it has entailed to live with those memories and scars during the subsequent 70 plus years. So one thing I hesitate uh, in reading that is I, and there's exceptions, obviously. Um, there's some extremely sharp and 90 year old people out there, but how good is your memory? at that age just you know by you know biologically physically speaking because i know my memory is starting to um <laughs> uh you know go isn't it wasn't as great as it used to be um but so i'm just curious about that but then again having if you live through it then it's literally seared right into your mind so we'll see i'm gonna read this and and just really take it in
Sheftal has spent years personally interviewing survivors who lived well into the 21st century, allowing him to construct portraits of what Hiroshima was like before the bomb and how catastrophically its citizens' lives changed in the seconds, minutes, days, weeks, months, and years afterwards. Okay, he stands out among historians due to his fluency in spoken and written Japanese and his longtime immersion in Japanese society that has allowed him, a white American, the unheard of access to these atomic bomb survivors in the waning years of their lives. Their trust in him is evident in the personal and traumatic depths they open up for him as he records their stories. Wow. Hiroshima should be required reading for the modern age. The personal accounts it contains will serve as cautionary tales about the horror and insanity of nuclear warfare, reminding them it is hoped that the world still lives with this danger at our doorstep. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be taking my time with this one. Because I, I do want to take my time. I don't want to rush. I don't want to rush this. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is this is this is why I read history is I want to connect with people's experiences and take some time. But anyway, this is coming out from Dutton Dutton Books, September 10th, uh, and I am on it. So it's hard to get that out there to you. Okay, the next book I hope to have a review written. It's another whopper. It is another Whopper. Wow, 570 pages. Oh, and in my last video, I talked to uh, fiction, right? I had two fiction books in there from um, a publishing house called Shokin or Shokin. It's a Jewish publishing house. Well, this book is also from Shokin. And I'll be reviewing this for the Washington Independent Review of Books. And I need to get going on it. <laughs> Woo! It's a big one. No road leading back. An improbable escape from the Nazis and the tangled way we tell the story of the Holocaust by Chris Heath. It's a very kind of hazy... I don't know. I mean, if this... Uh, color contrast might be good. I know they're going for like a hazy kind of smoke filled. We don't know what's in the forest. It's kind of scary look, but um, yeah, no road leading back. It's kind of vague. Um, technically, I so said this book comes out September 3rd. This book is 640 pages, but it looks like my readable stuff here minus 500, oh, 570, 80 pages. There's a lot. We got a lot going on here. Let me read this to you. No Road Leading Back is the remarkable story of a dozen prisoners who escaped from the site where more than 70,000 Jews were shot in the Lithuanian forest of Ponar after the Nazi invasion of Eastern Europe in 1941. Anxious to hide the incriminating evidence of the murders, the SS later in the war enslaved a group of Jews to exhume every one of the bodies and incinerate them all in a month's long labor an episode whose specifics are staggering and disturbing, even within the context of the Holocaust. From that dire circumstance emerges the improbable escape made by some of the men who dug a tunnel with bare hands and spoons while they were trapped and guarded day and night, an act not just of bravery and desperation, but of awesome imagination. Based on first-person accounts of the escapees, and on each scrap of evidence that has been documented, repressed, or amplified since this book resurrects their lives while also providing a complex, urgent analysis of why their story has rarely been told and never accurately. Hmm. Chris Heath explores the cultural use and misuse of Holocaust testimony and the need for us to face it and all uncomfortable historical truths with honesty and accuracy. Fantastic. All right, so uh, that's going to be pretty sobering. Um, from Shokin Books, September 3rd. Yes. There's a lot going on in here, but there at least there's some, there's some, uh, at least the ARC has some of the pictures that are going to be printed in the, the finished copy, right? Maybe. I might still have to ask for the finished just to see. I mean, there's a few things in here, you know. Mm, on returning. All right, so big, hefty, kind of like 
dark read. <laughs> Jeez. But also, you know, hey, they escaped, too. I want to see how, um, how they manage that. Um, 40 minutes. Okay, one more book. Well, and then I want to show you what I got at Barnes & Noble. So hang around for that because I also got a treat. Um, so this book's not coming out until November 19th from the New Press. Uh, I am scheduled to review this as well. This is by Jeff Forrett. Oh, I think I already showed this in my New History on the Horizon. I think I might have did oh, most of these. No, did I? You guys, I can't. I don't think I showed you No, Lo no Road Leading Back, and I don't... Did I show you a day in September? I don't think I did. But anyway, in case... I might have shown this to you already, but... No, I did, because someone mentioned it in my comments. They said the price they paid looked really good. I think um, Bill Rutenberg mentioned that uh, He's interested in reading this, but yeah. Um, so I, I've already mentioned this in my New History on the Horizon video from, I think, uh, just go you know, check out my archive. I think it's episode 17 or 18. Check it out. Uh, I list that on here. But anyway, um, I need to get into this one. I have also have to get the review due in soon. I'm sorry I'm yawning. I don't know what happened. I had a big burst of energy this afternoon. Uh... And now I'm hitting the wall. It's <laughs> now it's 420, and I've got to make a thumbnail and upload this, and um, I've got to do some reading. Obviously, um, I got to make some headway in. I'd like to write the review of this by Monday or Tuesday. So uh, it's it's a slim read. So I got about 230 pages left on that. I'm going to try to knock that out. And then I'm going to start the price they paid. Slavery, shipwrecks, and reparations before the Civil War, which is about... Um, yeah, the, the reparations went to the, uh, the, the people... <laughs> I don't even want to... <laughs> between this book <laughs> and this book, I'm just going to get a whole lot of pissed off. <laughs> uh... I don't, yeah. I just don't get it. I just don't get racism. I just don't get it. I don't understand. It just treating people, in, all human beings in a humane way. I, why is this so hard? You know? Like, why is this just so damn hard? Um, you know, God does not see skin color. He sees your heart. He sees your heart. So, uh, that should scare a lot of you out there. <laughs> Not that you would be watching this channel, but I mean, you know, uh, yeah. He's not looking at your flag. He's not looking at your uh, your sex. He's not looking at your, your race. He's not looking at anything. He's looking at your heart. He knows your heart more intimately than any, any human being could ever. Um, and uh, he knows your heart. And uh, he wants you to love other people. That's what God calls us to do. Amen. Can I get an amen? Praise Jesus. Yes, indeed. Praise Jesus. That's what I say in this channel. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So, yeah, that's quite the big old stack. Well, one of them I've already read and, and one of them I'm almost finished with. But, yeah, so there's some stuff going on there. And then my periodicals. Again, check out the Strand, Strand Magazine, and check out that Rod Serling story. Uh, I'm going to finish it um, probably today. Is it, uh, I was going to say lunchtime, but no, it's not. It's 4.23, and I don't know what we're doing for dinner. So Peggy's got to <laughs> end this. Uh, but okay, fun times. Went to Barnes & Noble. I'm a Barnes & Noble member. I did a whole video on, you know, whether it pays to be a, um, do I have it on me? I know I used it for the purposes of that video, like, Barnes & Noble membership, baby. Right? You know, you get your discounts on books, 10% discount on books and magazines, uh, pre-orders. And um, and I still, I mean, I get gift cards all the time for my payback on my uh, credit cards. I, I always choose a Barnes & Noble gift card because they, it's handy with the free shipping as being a member. But anyway, so I went there, and I went there for this magazine. Okay, 
Uh, where did I see? I saw it somewhere. Oh, yeah, it might have been there. But anyway, so I got this. I wanted this issue of Harper's, and then I ended up subscribing to it because I get bombarded with junk mail um, and subscription notices or, you know, people like, subscribe, try this, because you know, I subscribe to a lot of magazines and journals. Harper's will send me stuff, and I just, I don't even open it. I just throw it into the recycle bin. But this time I opened it, and it was like $9 for a year. Like, they are... They're, they're, they really need some help. So I was like, okay, I do it. I do it for you. I subscribe. But I really wanted this issue because I want to read this this vol, uh, William T. Volman um, article on Korea's DMZ. And uh, this is interesting to me, this whole new, the new satanic panic, exorcism in the age of TikTok. And frankly, I haven't read a Harper's Magazine since I was in the Air Force. And that was 30 odd years ago. So I, I don't know. I, I wanted to see, again, like, you know, do they have a new layout? Are they doing things differently? Are they, is there writing in, you know, oh, this is so good. But here's that article by uh, Volman that I, I'm going to be tapping into, hopefully, this weekend. Um, now I just saw a book I want to get. <laughs> see, see how this happens? You, you watched it live. You saw it in real time. As I'm showing you the article, you see Peggy's eyes go to over here. I'm like, well, what is this? What is this about? Ravens on a wire. Andrew Basevich, I, I've read his nonfiction. This looks like he's he's doing a, um, he's trying to do fiction as well. So I might have to check that out. <laughs> That's how it happens, guys. Um, so Korean Hearts at the DMZ, an article by William T. Volman. Um Korea has always intrigued me. The history of Korea, the war, North Korea, just the hermit kingdom, and um, the prison, the open-air prison they live in, in North Korea. Yeah, this is great stuff. I had to get this out. Uh, this, uh, this is a very long article by Bowman, so I'm, I'm tickled. Um, well, I get a section on memoir. So I'm just going dis- to, I'm going to explore Harper's again and see if I, if I, uh, you know, it might be one I want to stick with. So I wanted to get that. And I'm glad that they had two They had two issues of this left. And it's for the, uh, this is the August issue. And I think this is one I was getting ready to, to go bye-bye. So I'm glad I got this. I think my sub- subscription will probably start with a September issue. So. so I picked up Harper's. And I've seen this journal a few times. And I've always... Just, eh, I said, no, I don't have time. I don't you know. But there was an article in here on AI, a couple of articles on here on AI. And and then I looked at who's on the masthead because some of these journals, these um, current, like, current affair, or current events journals slash national, you know, state of the nation kind of stuff. Uh, you just, you have to read their uh, their mission statement to see, like, you know, what angle are you coming from is this a middle of the road journal is this a left journal is this a right journal but then i saw that the editor is yuval levin um and uh he wrote a book on um he wrote a couple of different things that were uh books that or you know books or premises that i might be more in line with it doesn't really matter because i just wanted to check this out to see What am I saying? I'm saying I'm giving this this journal a chance because I don't know what what's going to be in it. But I picked up National Affairs. Uh, the only name on here that I recognize actually is um, Naomi Schaefer Riley, The Limits of Parents' Rights. So uh, I'm just intrigued. And this is the uh, summer issue, so it's just a quarterly journal, nine dollars. I wanted to also read, I wanted to read this article, The Case for AI Optimism. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm reading this for my own um, vocation, my career, and where, you know, how it's going to be used in higher education. So, um, also, this other article looked really good. I'm fascinated by, because my job is in higher education, um, in a nonprofit that serves that community. Um 
I love articles like this one here is going to talk about the miseducation of America's teachers. I, I just want to keep up, you know, um, professionally on the state of things with uh, higher education and then especially with AI coming on, coming online, um, unified theory of education. So I thought I'd give it a try. Uh, I've never read national affairs before. So if any of you out there are, have, I would be bowled over. I would be really surprised if anyone out there who watches my channel reads this. So surprise me. <laughs> Someone out there will tell me, oh, yeah, I read National Affairs. It's great. Or it sucks or whatever. But uh, National Affairs. So I picked up that. And then so I went up to the counter, you know, and I got like two bucks off of these, both of these. Um, she's like, I see you're a Barnes & Noble member. And I was like, yeah, man. And she says, did you get a, you, did you get your bag this year? Now, I could have sworn, I said, yeah, I think I did. She goes, it was back in May, right? And I was like, um, May of this year or May of last year? Like, time is really, I cannot keep track of time anymore. Like, so either way, I was like, um, maybe I didn't get the bag. And then I didn't want her to think I was trying to play her to try to get a second bag. You know, I was like, I said, is there a way to check to see if, if I've already gotten my bag for the year? She goes, no, it won't show on the computer. And I was like, well, um, then she says, well, what color bag did you get? I said, it was blue. And I said, and I see that you don't have any blue out here. She goes, no, we haven't had blue here uh, in, a, in, in many, 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 like a long time. So she goes, I think you got your bag from last year, last May. And I was like, probably did. She goes, so go ahead and pick a bag. And so I did. They, uh, they had black. They had the black one, silver one, and then this one, which is a new one. And I just love it. Um, this is, I got my free a bag of books. So I asked her, I said, um, I thought that was just a one-time thing then. I said, so the, my Barnes & Noble membership, I, don't, I get a free tote bag every year. I said, I only thought I got like one-time usage, you know, one time. And she goes, no, yeah, every year you can get a free tote bag. And I said, well, membership does pay. <laughs> I got as a bag of books on both sides. So I got a nice orange burnt umber, kind of getting ready for fall. Um, so now I've got two Barnes and Noble tote bags and I'm so, so, uh, tickled by that. All right. So this was your long chatty Friday reads video, 52 minutes. My Lord, I apologize about that. Anyway, guys, you can see both of my girls are knocked out. You can see, uh, Daisy right over here. Well, there she is. She is sleeping. There's her little belly. And then Roxy's almost, you can't even see her hidden in that. She's sleeping. They got the right idea, but now I got to go figure out what's for dinner and what's going on with my hair. What is that? Hello. Ooh, we've got movement. You've got movement. <laughs> um, thanks for joining me again, guys. Um, I always like just having a chatty video with you every now and then. So until next time, um, thanks for being a return viewer. Thanks for checking out the channel for the first time. Yay. Subscribe. You know, if you can, show me some love. And um, until next time, BookTube, take care out there. Have a great weekend. And uh, hopefully I'll make another video this weekend. So talk to you soon and keep reading. Nope. It's still too close to Bill's. He says happy reading. I'm just going to say, <sighs> you know what? I'm going to think on it. I'm going to come up with a catchy closing line. I'm going to ask for Martine's help. Okay. Operation tagline. Maybe you guys can help me. <laughs> okay, BookTube, until next time, thanks for joining me here on the History Shelf. Take care.